after this chapter, they kind of fall into the background and Daniel becomes uh, the main character at this point. But this is the first time in this chapter that we're going to find that these people taking a stand results in, in what could be a dangerous situation for them. See, up to this point, when they've done something, they've been exalted for it. Now they have to choose. They have to take a stand. It's either bow down to an idol or don't, and the results can be disastrous. They find themselves in jeopardy because of their actions. So literally, we could say that these people are in the hot seat. Nobody laughed at that. <laughs> All right, since you didn't laugh, we're going to read the whole chapter word for word. <laughs> Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to read the first seven verses and I'm going to kind of stop and pick them apart. This is my objective today. My objective is to get through the whole chapter. I think we have time and I'm going to read almost every verse. Not as a form of punishment, but I think it's important. So here's the first seven verses. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that the king had set up. I hope that you're asking, how do we go from the end of chapter 2 where the king says, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings, to this? How do we go from that to this so quickly? Well, in our Bible, it is very quickly, but the time span between chapter 2 and chapter 3 is roughly 23 years. So there's a 23-year gap between the two chapters here. So in 23 years, a lot can happen. And what I want to point out to you this morning from these seven verses is it really highlights the, that humanity has a propensity toward pride. That's what we see happening in King Nebuchadnezzar here. Uh, he had a brief moment at the end of chapter 2 where he recognized God, but it appears that he never committed to God. And see, that's the difference. There's a difference between recognizing God and committing to God. It's easy to recognize God and give him lip service, which that's what King Nebuchadnezzar did. But Nebuchadnezzar is an arrogant leader that thrived on power and control. And really, the image that he's setting up, it reflects back to the dream that we didn't discuss in much detail. See, in the dream, there was an image that was present, and the, the part of the image that was gold was only the head. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, well, that head of gold, that represents you, your kingdom. And it would be shattered, and then another kingdom would take place. But what we see here is that Nebuchadnezzar says, never mind the dream, I'm going to erect my own statue, it's going to be all gold. Right. So, what we're going to see as this chapter unfolds, I think it's just God being true to his word to his people. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23, uh, the writer wrote, Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. And this is what we're going to see work out in this chapter. But there's something else that's going on here that I think is important to note. You'll notice that when they describe what's taking place, it says nations and peoples of every language are present at this time. See, the Babylonian Empire was a mixed bag of ethnicities. And when you think about Babylon, it might might help you to think about the United States of America because the United States of America is a mixed bag of ethnicities. We have people from a lot of different heritages, right? And yet we all call ourselves 
American. This is kind of what Babylon was. Babylon was the dominating empire of the time, but it was comprised of a multitude of different kinds of people. There, were, there was a diversity of religious beliefs. Uh, there were a lot of ethnic differences, a lot of different languages. So what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here is he is trying to use religion to unify a very diverse group of people. Right? They, they have a lot of different gods that they're all worshiping and serving. So he says, I am going to erect this gold idol, and this is going to be everybody's god. This is what you have to do. As part of the Babylonian Empire, when you hear this music and all this stuff going on, you have to fall down and worship this idol. Now, I want you to put yourself in this situation you have the, this statue, I think the things that I read, it was about 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. There's no way that it could be solid gold because of its stature. It was probably gold-plated, but it was still magnificent to look at. Now put yourself in this situation. All of these people, multitudes and multitudes of people, very diverse. Different skin colors, different languages, different dialects, different beliefs. And the king makes this decree at the sound of all this music, you have to bow down and worship this God. And everybody falls to the ground. Their foreheads touch the ground except for three. All right, that, that's the image that we have except for three. And multitudes of people blindly bow down to the image. But three stand firm. Let's go to verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, here, here's what's going on in, the, in these few verses. It's plain and simple. This is racism. This is racism at work. You have, uh, my translation, the NIV says astrologers. Some of you may have a note or a different translation that says the Chaldeans. So this is a group of people. The Chaldeans point out the Jews aren't doing what you've asked, Right? And not only is it a racist thing, but it's a jealousy thing, right? So remember what happened to Daniel and his friends. At the end of chapter 2, they're exalted. They're given some authority. Who didn't get the authority? The Chaldeans didn't get the authority because they couldn't interpret the dream. So now you have these Jewish guys who have authority over these Chaldeans, and the Chaldeans, aren't, they don't like it. Why? They're different than us. That's what they point out to the king. First, look, they're Jews. And two, they don't worship the same way we do. They don't worship the same God we do. So there's a problem. See, the world system is one of conformance. That's what's expected of these people. Become like us, or we're going to have, have it out for you. Right? That's what these guys are saying. Look, they're not like us, and they refuse to become like us. They won't even worship like us. King, what are you going to do? So here's what I want you to write down. Failure to conform puts an easy target on our backs for those who are against us. And you're probably saying, man, this is a downer message today. Well, yep, right now it is, but it's not going to be. Look, we live in a culture that talks out of both sides of its mouth. One, out of one side of the mouth of the culture, it says we, we prize individualism. We think that's important. We want everybody to be their own person. But out of the other side of our culture's mouth, we look down on those people that are different from us. And this happens on both sides or whatever side of the aisle you find yourself on or whatever side of life you find yourself on. It happens, right? We don't like people that are different from us. It's, it's kind of in our nature. And the problem for us as followers of Christ is that's the call. Be different. Don't conform, right? Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So failure to conform, that's what these men experience. Failure to conform, conform puts a target on your back. 
And honestly, the gospel that Jesus calls us to, it's, it's difficult. The gospel that we're called to live out in our life looks a lot like what these men experience. It looks like really having a mark on your back because you're different, set apart. God says, be holy because he's holy. That word holy means set apart, different. So let's go to verse 13. So you need to write that down. Failure to conform puts an easy target on our backs. Now we get back to the king here. In verse 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then there's something interesting that happens right here. Then what God will be able to rescue, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. So the king really ups the ante here. Because at first, the king's initial problem is with man. You're not falling down and doing what I said. But now he challenges God. Right? And it shows his arrogance and pride. He says, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? So the king is really like saying, okay, I'm above the gods here. Even the gods that I believe, I'm above them. Because none of them are going to be able to rescue you from my hand. And when you challenge mankind it can be hard but when you start to challenge a living god <laughs> yeah, look out it's a bad deal <clears throat> so verses 16 through 18 there's going to be something i want you to take away from this a couple things shadrach meshach and abednego replied to him king nebuchadnezzar we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Hopefully one of the questions that you're beginning to wrestle with is, if we're expected to be set apart, if we're expected to be different, and if we know that being set apart and different is going to put a mark on our back, how is it that we remain faithful? What does that look like? That should be the question on all of your minds. So these men, they say this, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. I like the way the King James Version says it. The King James Version says, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter, which means we don't even have to think about what we're going to say. It's a no-brainer. You know, the king is here, and he says, okay, guys, I really liked you. You know, I, 20 years ago, I put you in a pretty good position, and I liked you. But now, you're causing problems. So I'm going to give you one more chance. He didn't give anybody else a second chance, but I'll give you a second chance. Just bow down. Look, it's a no-brainer for us, king. We're not going to do it. But then... What they say next is even more fascinating. But I want you to write this down. The decisions regarding faithfulness in the future are decided in the present. Let me explain that. The decisions regarding faithfulness in the future are decided in the present. Why was it that these men could say, we don't have to think about it? Because they had already made the decision that if it came to this, we're standing firm. How do you know that? Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. These men are a lot like Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. This is before he says, I'm not eating the food. And these men are the same way. This is before they faced the temptation to bow down to an idol. They had purposed in their heart because faithfulness in the future is decided in the present. What does that mean for us? That means that we get the opportunity to make the decision today 
whether or not in the future, if we're faced with a situation like this, we will be faithful or not. What you do tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday is decided today in your heart. You know, when you look at what faithfulness is described as, it's not a fly by the seat of your pants type of faithfulness. It's calculated. This is what Jesus said in in Luke 14, uh, verses 25 through 33. It's really talking about this section of text in the Gospel of Luke is talking about what does it mean to be a disciple. Some of your headings may say the cost of being a disciple. And Jesus talks about being a disciple, and he compares it to a person that wants to build a tower. And he says, who's going to sit down and build a tower without first sitting down and estimating the cost? Or what king is going to go out to battle, to war, without first sitting down and determining what it would cost him to go to war? And this is what we see with these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had determined a long time ago what the cost of their faithfulness would be. So when standing in front of the king, faced with the temptation, they they can say, I don't even have to think about it, king. I decided that a long time ago, that I'm going to stand. I'm not going to bow before anyone except my God. So that's not where it ends. And I think that's pretty amazing that they say, don't have to think about it. Here's what we're doing. What they say say next is even more impressive. In verse 17, they said, if we're thrown into the blazing blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to, to deliver us from it. I have never caught that until this week. He doesn't, they don't say he will deliver us. They said he's able to deliver us. So they, in their mind, they're saying, well, he can. Don't know if he's going to. They go on to say, but he will deliver us from your hand. So what they're doing is they're laying out two options. In our mind, we have two options. God's going to, he can deliver us from the furnace, but he doesn't have to. Either way, if he delivers us from the furnace or if he doesn't, either way, he's going to deliver us from your hand, king. That's what they're saying. My mind goes to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians when he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I think that's the mentality of these men. Look, if you throw us in the furnace, he can. Don't know if he's going to. He can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, that's what they go on to say. Even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your gods. Here's a real life example of this type of faithfulness. Hot off the press, really. My high school guidance counselor, um, I actually know him better after high school, which is kind of an irony. (laughs) But He's now a, a preacher as well, a minister in Fayette County. He has a grandson, had a grandson, who at four months old had to have a heart transplant. This, his grandson's name was Jared. He's been in the hospital since June. He died two days ago from a, an infection that they just couldn't get rid of. His heart, at 25 years old, the heart that he received at four months old, his body began to reject it 25 years later. And they actually put an artificial heart in, and it was working well, but the infection became too great. This morning, I look at his, he put, um, my high school guidance counselor puts a devotion on Facebook every day, every day. And in his devotion this morning, he said, I want to just inform everybody that my grandson passed away on the 24th, but my son reminded me of Daniel chapter 3, which he said, he was reminded that God was able to deliver Jared from that. Not that he would, but he was able to. But either way, God delivered Jared. That's, that's the kind of faith that these people are having in a real life example. Here you have a guy who lost a grandson at 25 years old who's saying God could have saved him. He chose not to. Now we, get, we get to points in life where we think that our best prayer should be, God, get me out of here. Get me out of this. Save me from this. And that's not what these men do. They don't say, God, get us out of here. They said, look, we know he can. We know he can. But if he doesn't, we're still winners. Having that type of perspective changes the way that we 
we do life. Move on to verse 19. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude changed toward them. The King James Version says that his face changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. I'm going to stop at verse 23 for just a minute. You've heard me talk about the Septuagint before. The LXX, it's abbreviated. Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament that actually predates the Masoretic text, which the Masoretic text is where we get our Old Testament from. You'll find these words added in the Greek Septuagint in verse 23. So verse 23 in the Septuagint sounds like, And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then it goes on to say, They walked around in the midst of the flames, singing hymns to God and blessing the Lord. That's what the Septuagint says. So here's where I want to stop, and I want to point something out. Write this down. One way that people will encounter God is witnessing the way that we suffer. Because look what happens next. One way that people will encounter God is witnessing the way that we suffer. These three men are tied up and cast into this furnace. And the people that are doing this, it's so hot that they die. They go into the furnace, and according to the Septuagint, they walk around, they sing hymns, and they bless the Lord. And the king takes note. The king recognizes what's happening. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like, now the NIV says, looks like a son of the gods. Some of yours may say a son of God. Who is this? It's Jesus. It's the, it's the son incarnate. You know, in the Old Testament, Jesus pops up from time to time. He, can, he just wants people to know, hey, I'm around here, right? This is him. He's in there. Now, interestingly, it, it looks like the only person, to me, the way I read this, it looks like the only person that can see the fourth man is Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't look like anybody else saw it. Right? Because he asked, weren't there three? Well, yeah, there's only three in there. Well, I see four. So Nebuchadnezzar goes up and he, he calls out to him, hey, guys, come out here. I'm going to summarize the rest of this. Come out here. So they come out of the fire. Now, the big miracle in this is that the, the guys aren't burned up. They don't die. The small miracle that nobody talks about is the fact that they come out of there and they have all their clothes on. They're not burned off and they don't even smell like smoke. That's amazing. Now, what happens next? Then Nebuchadnezzar said, see, there's a pattern here. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. People are watching the way that we suffer. And just like everything else that this book tells us, the way that we suffer should be different from the world around us. Because part of remaining faithful in a foreign land requires that we suffer well. We, don't, we may not like to hear that, but that's the reality. Part of being faithful in a foreign land requires that we suffer well. So we have to ask the question, at least I ask myself this question, do I sing through my suffering? what these guys did. And I thought about, you know, Paul, right? When he was in prison, we learned one of the things that he did, well, he sang hymns, right? And the people heard this. He sang hymns, the people heard it, and it turned their attention to the God of Paul. 
in this situation with these three men. They fall down, they're singing hymns, and the king says, what the, what's going on? Or do we grumble and complain through our suffering? Uh, a few weeks ago in leadership class, we talked about this idea of suffering and, and complaining and grumbling. And we kind of make light in our, our culture about grumbling and playing. We don't think it's that big a deal. But according to Paul, grumbling and complaining is a big, big deal. When you read through the Old Testament, you'll find that the reason the Israelites didn't inherit the promised land was because of their grumbling and complaining. I think that's fascinating. It wasn't, it wasn't noted that it was because of their unfaithfulness so much as it was their grumbling and complaining. You know, they thought they were suffering, grumbling and complaining. So suffering looks different though, right? When we have a perspective that either way it doesn't matter. God can take us out of this or not. He may not. He can. But whether he does or not is a different story. But even if he doesn't take us out of this suffering, we're still going to be victorious. That brings a different perspective to suffering. See, when we understand that in our suffering, it may look like it ends bad for us, the reality is we win. This is, a, this is a perspective that many of us don't have, but we should have re, regarding death. I did a funeral yesterday. I've, ha, I've had, I can't tell you how many funerals I've done. I've done way more funerals than weddings. I'm probably, what, what do you think I'm getting close to what? Uh, 50, 60, 70 funerals, somewhere around there? Maybe more than that in, in what, five or six years of ministry. And, and it's always fascinating to me to see how people look at death. You know, because I'll even talk to believers. And believers a lot of times say, you know, Sean, we prayed that God would heal this person. We prayed so hard that God would heal this person, and he didn't. They died. And I finally got the courage one time to say, so you think God didn't answer your prayer? Yeah, because this person died. I said, what if that is healing? What if death is healing? And they just kind of looked at me and said, you know, we pray for healing, and in our mind we say, God, we want you to heal this person because we want to keep them here. But sometimes death is the ultimate healing, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. So maybe God did answer your prayer. He just didn't know what you were asking for. See, what we learn here from this text Proverbs 29, 23, pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. These men, they take a stand. They refuse to bow. God is honored. They're promoted. And the king continues his downward spiral. That's what we're going to see as we go through this book. This king is on a downward spiral. And even though he makes this, um, makes this statement again about God, Right, this is the second time we've seen him make this statement. Oh, man, their God's great. Look at what he did. He delivered him. We're going to see that he continues this path toward arrogance and pride. And his pride and arrogance leads to his demise. But the faithful people, even though the situation looks dire, even though they're still in captivity, God exalts them. And as a result, because they're exalted... People recognize their God. So the challenge for us in our culture and our society, we are going to experience suffering. It, it, it's going to happen. I actually believe that as we continue in, in time, in history, that if we're followers of Jesus, our suffering will become greater. I believe that. I believe that we have to make a decision today about what we will do in the future when it comes to who we will bow down to or not. I really believe that. We have to decide today, we have to be like these men in purpose in our heart, what we will do today when the decision comes tomorrow or five years from now or 10 years from now. Because today is when the decision is made. So when we get to these positions where things, wow, things aren't the way they used to be, we're not caught off guard. We can say, I know. I've already decided how I'll respond. And that's the challenge I want to issue this morning. We're going to take communion together.
And as we take communion, I think that's the point, right? We want to reflect on Christ. And when we reflect on Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, those kind of decisions become easier. When we realize that even if God chooses not to deliver me from the trials of this life, I'm promised a resurrected life. I'm promised a life eternal in the presence of God. How much greater would that be? It's great to experience the presence of God here in suffering and pain, but how much greater would it be to experience the presence of God absent from suffering and pain? So as we take communion together this morning, I'm going to ask that we do it a little different. I'm going to go ahead and ask the worship team to come forward. So the worship team, if you want to take it now, go ahead and take it or take it later, that's fine. But I want you to come forward. And as they sing, I want you to reflect on some of the difficult decisions that you may be asked to make. And then I want you to reflect on how the broken body and the blood of Jesus makes that decision possible. Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. Thank you for being a God that can deliver us from any evil that we face in this life. And thank you for the promise that you will deliver us and restore all things and make this creation new. God, I pray today that we would purpose in our hearts the decisions that we may have to make in the future, that we would solidify it now, that we would remain faithful, that we would stand firm when we're asked to compromise. God, continue to reveal yourself to us. Help us to suffer well so that when people see us, they see you with us and in us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.